How to Abolish War The Background Before offering this plan for the prevention of war, it seems necessary to sketch briefly a background that will clearly describe the principle which constitutes the warp and the woof of the plan. The causes of war may be properly omitted for the reason that they have but little, if any, relation to the principle through which war may be prevented. The beginning of this sketch deals with two important factors which constitute the chief controlling forces of civilization. One is physical heredity, and the other is social heredity. The size and form of the body, the texture of the skin, the color of the eyes, and the functioning power of the vital organs are all the result of physical heredity. They are static and fixed, and cannot be changed, for they are the result of a million years of evolution. But by far the most important part of what we are is the result of social heredity, and came to us from the effects of our environment and early training. Our conception of religion, politics, economics, philosophy, and other subjects of a similar nature, including war, is entirely the result of those dominating forces of our environment and training. The Catholic is a Catholic because of his early training, and the Protestant is a Protestant for the same reason, but this is hardly stating the truth with sufficient emphasis. For it might be properly said that the Catholic is a Catholic and the Protestant is a Protestant because he cannot help it. With but few exceptions, the religion of the adult is the result of his religious training during the years between four and fourteen, when his religion was forced upon him by his parents or those who had control of his schooling. A prominent clergyman indicated how well he understood the principle of social heredity when he said, Give me the control of the child until it is twelve years old, and you can teach it any religion you may please after that time, for I will have planted my own religion so deeply in its mind that no power on earth could undo my work. The outstanding and most prominent of man's beliefs are those which were forced upon him, or which he absorbed of his own volition under highly emotionalized conditions, when his mind was receptive. Under such conditions, the evangelist can plant the idea of religion more deeply and permanently during an hour's revival service than he could through years of training under ordinary conditions, when the mind was not in an emotionalized state. The people of the United States have immortalized Washington and Lincoln because they were the leaders of the nation during times when the minds of the people were highly emotionalized, as the result of calamities which shook the very foundation of our country and vitally affected the interest of all the people. Through the principle of social heredity, operating through the schools, American history, and through other forms of impressive teaching, the immortality of Washington and Lincoln is planted in the minds of the young, and in that way kept alive. The three great organized forces through which social heredity operates are the schools, the churches, and the public press. Any ideal that has the active cooperation of these three forces may, during the brief period of one generation, be forced upon the minds of the young so effectively that they cannot resist it. In 1914, the world awoke one morning to find itself aflame with warfare on a scale previously unheard of, and the outstanding feature of importance of that worldwide calamity was the highly organized German armies. For more than three years, these armies gained ground so rapidly that world domination by Germany seemed certain. The German military machine operated with efficiencies such as had never before been demonstrated in warfare. With Kultur as her avowed ideal, modern Germany swept the opposing armies before her as though they were leaderless, despite the fact that the Allied forces outnumbered her own on every front. The capacity for sacrifice in the German soldiers in support of the ideal of Kultur was the outstanding surprise of the war, and that capacity was largely the result of the work of two men. Through the German educational system, which they controlled, the psychology which carried the world into war in 1914 was created in the definite form of Kultur. These men were Adalbert Falk, Prussian Minister of Education until 1879, and the German Emperor William II. The agency through which these men produced this result was social heredity, the imposing of an ideal on the minds of the young under highly emotionalized conditions. Kultur, as the national ideal, was fixed in the minds of the young Germany, beginning first in the elementary schools and extending on up through the high schools and universities. The teachers and professors were forced to implant the ideal of Kultur in the minds of the students, 
and out of this teaching, in a single generation, grew the capacity for sacrifice of the individual for the interest of the nation, which surprised the modern world. As Benjamin Kidd so well stated the case, the aim of the state of Germany was everywhere to orientate public opinion through the heads of both its spiritual and temporal departments, through the bureaucracy, through the officers of the army, through the state direction of the press, and last of all, through the state direction of the entire trade and industry of the nation, so as to bring the idealism of the whole people to a conception of, and to a support of, the national policy of modern Germany. Germany controlled the press, the clergy, and the schools. Therefore, is it any wonder that she grew an army of soldiers during one generation which represented to a man her idea of Kultur? Is it any wonder that the German soldiers faced certain death with fearless impunity, when one stops to consider the fact that they had been taught from early childhood that this sacrifice was a rare privilege? Turn now from this brief description of the modus operandi through which Germany prepared her people for war to another strange phenomenon, Japan. No Western nation, with the exception of Germany, has so clearly manifested its understanding of the far-reaching influence of social heredity as has Japan. Within a single generation, Japan has advanced from her standing as a fourth-rate nation to the ranks of nations that are the recognized powers of the civilized world. Study Japan and you will find that she forces upon the minds of her young, through exactly the same agencies employed by Germany, the ideal of subordination of individual rights for the sake of accumulation of power by the nation. In all of her controversies with China, competent observers have seen that back of the apparent causes of the controversies was Japan's stealthy attempt to control the minds of the young by controlling the schools. If Japan could control the minds of the young of China, she could dominate that gigantic nation within one generation. If you would study the effect of social heredity as it is being used for the development of a national ideal by still another nation of the West, observe what has been going on in Russia since the ascendancy to power of the Soviet government of Russia, which is now patterning the minds of the young to conform with the national ideal, the nature of which it requires no master analysis to interpret. That ideal, when fully developed during the maturity of the present generation, will represent exactly that which the Soviet government wishes it to represent. Of all the flood of propaganda concerning the Soviet government of Russia that has been poured into this country through the tens of thousands of columns of newspaper space devoted to it since the close of the war, the following brief dispatch is by far the most significant. Russ Reds Order Books Contracts being let in Germany for 20 million volumes. Educational propaganda is aimed chiefly at children. By George Witz. Special cable to the Chicago Daily News Foreign Service. Berlin, Germany, November 9, 1920. Contracts for printing 20 million books in the Russian language, chiefly for children, are being placed in Germany on behalf of the Soviet government by Gershebin, a well-known Petrograd publisher and a friend of Maxim Gorky. Grishebin first went to England, but was received with indifference when he broached the subject to the British government. The Germans, however, not only welcomed him eagerly, but submitted prices so low that they could not possibly be underbidden by any other country. The Ulsteins, Berlin newspaper and book publishers, have agreed to print several million of the books at less than cost. This shows what is going on over there. Far from being shocked by this significant press dispatch, the majority of the newspapers of America did not publish it, and those that did give it space placed it in an obscure part of the paper in small type. Its real significance will become more apparent some twenty-odd years from now, when the Soviet government of Russia will have grown an army of soldiers who will support to the man whatever national ideal the Soviet government sets up. The possibility of war exists as a stern reality today solely because the principle of social heredity has not only been used as a sanctioning force in support of war, but it has actually been used as a chief agency through which the minds of men have been deliberately prepared for war. For evidence with which to support this statement, examine any national or world history and observe how tactfully and effectively war has been glorified and so described that it not only did not shock the mind of the student, but it actually established a plausible justification of war. 
Go into the public squares of our cities and observe the monuments that have been erected to the leaders of war. Observe the posture of these statues as they stand as living symbols to glorify men who did nothing more than lead armies on escapades of destruction. Notice how well these statues of warriors, mounted on charging steeds, serve as agencies through which to stimulate the minds of the young and prepare them for the acceptance of war. Not only as a pardonable act, but as a distinctly desirable source of attainment of glory, fame, and honor. At the time of this writing, some well-meaning ladies are having the image of Confederate soldiers carved in the deathless granite on the face of Stone Mountain in Georgia, in figures a hundred feet tall, thus seeking to perpetuate the memory of a lost cause that never was a cause, and therefore the sooner forgotten the better. If these references to faraway Russia, Japan, and Germany seem unimpressive and abstract, then let us study the principle of social heredity as it is now functioning on a highly developed scale here in the United States, for it may be expecting too much of the average of our race to suppose that they will be interested in what is taking place outside of the spot of ground that is bounded on the north by Canada, on the east by the Atlantic, on the west by the Pacific, and on the south by Mexico. We, too, are setting up in the minds of our young a national ideal, and this ideal is being so effectively developed through the principle of social heredity that it has already become the dominating ideal of the nation. This ideal is the desire for wealth. The first question we ask about a new acquaintance is not, Who are you? but, What have you? And the next question we ask is, How can we get that which you have? Our ideal is not measured in terms of warfare, but in terms of finance and industry and business. Our Patrick Henrys and our George Washingtons and our Abraham Lincolns of a few generations ago are now represented by the able leaders who manage our steel mills and our coal mines and our timber lands and our banking institutions and our railroads. We may deny this indictment if we choose, but the facts do not support the denial. The outstanding problem of the American people today is the spirit of unrest upon the part of the masses who find the struggle for existence becoming harder and harder, because the most competent brains of the country are engaged in the highly competitive attempt to accumulate wealth and to control the wealth-producing machinery of the nation. It is not necessary to dwell at length upon this description of our dominating ideal, or to offer evidence in support of its existence, for the reason that its existence is obvious and as well understood by the most ignorant as it is by those who make a pretense of thinking accurately. So deeply seated has this mad desire for money become that we are perfectly willing for the other nations of the world to cut themselves to pieces in warfare so long as they do not interfere with our scramble for wealth. Nor is this the saddest part of the indictment that we might render against ourselves, for we are not only willing for other nations to engage in warfare, but there is considerable reason to believe that those of us who profit by the sale of war supplies actually encourage this warfare among other nations.' 